the best entrepreneurs that I meet, I'm really good at sales and marketing. And I don't mean Instagram and modern marketing. They actually get how to write good copy, good online. Yeah. That stuff hasn't changed, by the way. Mm -hmm. Most small businesses are not doing nowhere near enough marketing. So it's very easy to make some space. Jimbo the party man, my alias, was my first sort of flirtation with how powerful personal brands can be and how they can add rocket fuel to a business's marketing. One of our big rules for our businesses is folding into existing empire. So we won't buy anything that is not a vertical integration of the business. I said, yeah, we did buy an ice cream company, but we spent quite a million pounds on ice cream a year as a business. And I look at if we spend so much with a supplier, how can we buy it in and build that as part of our company? Entrepreneurs try to be managers and entrepreneurs combined. Very rarely works. I always say that you should employ the good people before you can afford them. I always didn't pay myself or paid others for years. And the pressure of having a payroll makes you a better business person because you know you get to pay that person. So you make sure you're getting in customers and making sure you're profitable. So you can be a little bit lazy if you haven't got positive pressure on you. The secret to building a great business, and this is my formula for success. So James, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to sit down and talk to you because I think your journey in business is really interesting. And when I was doing a bit of research and trying to learn about where this all started, I came to realize that you actually started your first company around the age of 15, yeah. called the Party Man Company. It was all sort of centered around this character, Jim Barry the Party Man. Yeah, that's right. So tell me a little bit about that, about the origins of the Party Man. Well, Jim Barry the Party Man, um, my alias was really my first sort of flirtation with how powerful personal brands can be and how they can add rocket fuel to a business's marketing. Yeah. And if you looked in the past, you know, you had the Walt Disney's, the Richard Branson's, the Steve Jobs, uh, that they used their personal brand to elevate their business's brand quicker with limited marketing budgets that most bootstrap businesses don't have. And what I did when I started out was I started something called Singer Entertainment, which was a mobile disco business. And I went with one of my sisters to her birthday party and I had a, uh, a magician there. And she called this magician um, and spoke about it. And all the kids in the class spoke about it. I thought, oh, I need to come up with a name because the kids, didn't, they remembered him as the person that was more powerful than his, you know, ABC limited, whatever he was called. Right, okay. So then I changed tact and quickly went to Jimbo the party and I realised kids would remember, I'd see, oh, we've got Jimbo coming to my party. They could use a personality. And then I went to schools and done free magic shows. It got me known within the whole school. And very quickly, um, I managed to build, you know, oh, I was loud, I was energetic, I was a little bit, you know, out there for the style of, traditional family entertainment at the time that was that everyone else was doing and then I just managed to build an agency off with all the work that I can do and that's what started the party main company and we became the biggest children's entertainment agency in the country. And you built that agency from right between 2001 2005 so you were pretty much 15 to 19? Yeah I mean by the time I was you know left school I was earning like £1,500 a week you know Back then, it was you know it was good money now, but it was really good money then. And I saved it all up and I bought a house when I was eighteen from the proceeds. And then another one when I was nineteen, and and, and then I just bought a house every year, um, and then remortgaged those with Lloyd's Bank, and um, managed to open my first family entertainment center. Because what I realised was what I was doing was swapping time for money with that business, and I was using my hands to make the money literally my hands and that's I thought well that's not a what I believe is a great business is a commercially profitable enterprise to work so then you get it and I was in it and on it and I thought well that's fine you know this is all right for a couple of years you know I would go out being on the tools but it was magic ones and balloon models on weekends in yeah. after store then I ran the business during the day and in the evenings that was the actual better building stuff I would recruit entertainers train entertainers up and then we moved into prop hire and bouncy castle hire. And I realized all this business was very low barrier to entry. And I wanted to move the business out to be higher barrier to entry. Because when you build businesses that are 
higher barrier to entry, you're protected because not everyone can do it. So that's why I always look now to do things that are higher barrier to entry. And that's why I could have been the first stand in Stain and Scent. At what point though, when you first created Jimbo the Party Man, did business, like big scale business come into your mind? Oh, I wanted to do it from the very beginning. I was very ambitious from the very beginning. But you know, like I always tell people, you know, these steps that you take that if you try and remove the steps, you don't have the knowledge to run a big business. Okay. So I always talk about my methodology for running great businesses is the four companies. You know, the company you are today, this is the one that pays all the bills. And you might be doing some stuff that you don't really want to do, but you're learning. Company number two is the company you really want to be. This is your vision company. What does it look like in the future? Company number three is a media or marketing company that is pushing all those well-qualified leads into those operating companies and then invest 50% of the profits from companies one and two into a property investment company, yeah. which is fourth company, um, so that if you go through a period of innovation, you can use the property company to allow you to innovate the companies. Well, I was very clear at a very early age that I wanted to employ people, that I wanted to build a big business, uh, and nothing was going to stop me doing it. But I'm, you know, because I didn't have shortcuts to do it, I, I think I'm one of the... You know, there's lots of companies now that use VC money and that, you know, have these unicorn moments. I'm probably one of the last millennial generation, I think, that going through this very brick and mortar approach to building entrepreneurial businesses. We're not a tech company. We're very, very much brick and mortar. And, you know, I think they're becoming harder and harder for people to start and build. But I think brick and mortar are always the ones that stand the test of time that might not make you know, the same EBITDA or profit numbers as a snazzy tech company. Yeah. But sometimes snazzy tech companies are around for a few years and they disappear. Yeah, that's true. I like businesses where you get a little bit of money from a lot of people a lot of the time with very predictable cash flow that doesn't start from zero each one. So I built the play centres. I looked at them a hack and I made them more regulated, more higher barrier to entry even still. And so that's when I started adding day nurseries to them to turn them into things that are much easier to fund because day nurseries, banks allow funding day nurseries that don't so much like funding measure. So when I used them together, it allowed me to scale that up and build a big chain of those. And then I bought a zoo and a farm park. And that's interesting because that is one thing that I did notice that whilst you do have all this diverse set of businesses, they do complement each other. Oh yeah, there's... We, we One of our big rules for our businesses is folding into existing empire. So we won't buy anything that is not a vertical integration of the business. I so said, yeah, we did buy an ice cream company, but we spent called a million pounds on ice cream a year as a business. And we're using that brand, Rossi, the Rossi ice cream. We're now making Rossi coffee, Rossi bread, Rossi donuts, and they're all sold through our businesses. So the second we bought that company, we've increased the turnover of that ice cream company on the back of our original businesses the transport for all of our food to all of our locations is all done in-house it's amazing to do those things i look at if we spend so much with a supplier how can we buy it in and build that as part of our company teddy tastic is our make a bear business um and do arts and crafts and we supply all the holiday parts but also our own businesses um and so that business grew very quickly because yeah we was able to be its biggest customer and give it the buying power to yeah. you know, outstrip competitors. That is really interesting because you clearly leveraged all these different businesses oh, yeah, to kind of yeah. grow together. If you look at our property company, you know, that not all of our tenants are us, but a big chunk of them are us. So our rent that our sites pay goes back into our property company. So it gets in this cycle of cash flow where the cash just stays in the group. Yes. We don't have to worry about rents going up and all of that unless we want them to. And a lot of people will use social media, books to learn about business. You've clearly had a passion for it and learn on the go as you've been building your businesses. Is there anything that you see in today's Gen Z millennial world where we're missing out on some things? I certainly meet people that, I think have just got it and they have the ability to think positively, yeah. um, creatively, um, and they have hunger. Right. Okay. And just an absolute desire and hunger to go further, quicker and faster than, than you can possibly imagine. That They've just got this something. 
But what they might not, they might have that desire, but they don't have the commercial awareness, which time teaches you. But also books can teach you. Like, if I go and ever do a talk in a school, I always say to kids, like, for 20 quid, would you like to spend six hours with the richest person in the world that owns Nike? Uh, or you know, one of the rich people or someone that owns Nike? And they'll say, yes. I said, we'll just go and buy their books. And you can literally find out how Nike was built for 20 quid, less on Amazon, you know, and you get that book and you desire, you know, you read it. And there's sort of 10 other books, I think, you know, that all share the same messages and you can read those books and really take the how-tos out of them and apply that to hunger and desire, which I think everyone says, oh, every generation is late, but there's, there's always the 5 or 10% in every generation that are very hard-working, driven, that want to work seven days a week, that mm -hmm. are just so driven. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about the other 90%, you know, that might not work as hard as countries become richer. But there's always that core, you know, there are probably a million in the UK out of the 65 million um, people that live here. There's a million people that are going to just always go, go, go. I'm intrigued about any of your early inspirations and role models. I was very lucky to read um, losing my virginity by Richard Branson when I was 16 that just gave me permission to employ people and if you're not good at something get other people to do it that are better than you so that book really massively helped me just seeing you know is a dyslexic man that's built an amazing amount of wealth and business and stuff and you know and the big takeaway from that book is I'm not good at this I just employ someone to do it we are talked in this country that if you first don't succeed try try again and it's drummed into us from a young age at school and actually that's why 35 percent of entrepreneurs in this country are dyslexic or self-made millionaires are dyslexic i honestly believe it's that they are given permission from a very young age to be able to think differently and to get help um and if they can't do something find a different way around it Mm -hmm. And I think that kicks some real power in entrepreneurship. Yeah, finding a different way to solve a problem and be able to do that from a young age has got to be powerful in entrepreneurship. How have you approached moments in your career where things haven't been so clear cut? How have you managed those types of challenges? Well, for me, you know, my business is always cash flow. You know, that they're the most stressful thing for lots of businesses. You know, they. Lots of people want to grow their business. They like the idea of building a team. They like the idea of running your premises, investing into commercial property, buying another company. And then they look and they go, I want to do all these things. But cash flow is the thing that's going to stop me. When you're building brick and mortar businesses like me, you know, you know, if I look at, you know, on Friday, I you know, paid a lot of money for a hundred year old ice cream parlor that we used to own as part of our ice cream business. A yeah, million pound deal there. We're buying a hotel. You know, we're building a dinosaur park. Um, I went to look for another visitor attraction on Sunday. That all bubble, bubble, bubble. All these things. If you add them all up, you know, I've got to fund all this stuff. And what? And yeah, then yeah, how are you going to do it? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that can stop people and make me very stressful. Especially if you have a mindset like I have that I should always be doing more because why not? Is that is that kind of a motto that you've always had? Wait, people do ask me all the time, well, why are you doing this? I always said, why not? Why not me? And why not see how far you can go? I, I constantly think now I've probably got 35 good summers left. And that's not a lot, is it? We'll see 35 more autumns. Mm -hmm. you know, why don't you try and push yourself and see what's, and I enjoy what I do. Um, and or it might, you know, I have less cash flow problems now. I don't have running cash flow you know, my cash flow problems are where can i get the next million pound two million pound to go and buy this and go do this i'm creating all those problems myself mm -hmm. i don't need to go and buy those things my lifestyle isn't going to change them you know i've under them luckily i have a very nice house i have a wonderful family I, I you know i have a nice car i have all those things but why am i doing it just because i've got this inner drive to go and do stuff and i want to you know, some people like a nice watch, I'd rather buy it another zoo. One thing that came to my mind was obviously COVID would have been a bit of a challenge for you. I straight away knew there would be opportunities. I'm not, not worried about those things because, you know, everyone's going through it. 
And so I just say, we'll survive. And we did. It was actually easier in COVID running a business, I think, than any of my career. Mm-hmm. And anyone that's telling you otherwise um, is lying to you. In my opinion, you've got lower VAT, you've got no business rates, your government's getting our money all the time, but best ways you can borrow money. We went on our own now. You know, you've got to be dynamic. And you've got to spend most of your time on getting and keeping customers um, and driving sales into your business to get through. So that COVID was a walk in the park. I mean, I'd like to say a bit more about that because closing your doors. Everyone is going through. So what's the point in worrying about it? If I was the only one, yeah, and that would be very stressful. If the government said, you're the only business that's closing and everyone else is allowed to carry on, yeah, I would be petrified. But that, that, that power has been removed from me and I haven't got an army and a police force to come and retaliate to the government. So you just accept it. And I started innovating and planning. That's where entrepreneurs are just yeah, brilliant. They they see those opportunities. Yeah, we open a farm shop. We open a Christmas shop. I documented on YouTube actually building a million pound business in a pandemic from scratch. It was a fantastic little documentary we made, and and we did it. There was so many opportunities for businesses, you know, that that wanted to make money in in the coronavirus. As long as they were prepared to pivot and innovate. And if you don't innovate, you're going to evaporate. You're in a process of confident innovation. Mm-hmm. But when you're all in the same boat and all got the same rules and measures around you and knowing that you live in a, a fair country, which it was that got to the UK all the time, but the government, yeah, we're very lucky. If you go to other countries around the world, that people don't realise how easy it is to do business in the UK, you know. People were saying Brexit ruined their businesses and COVID ruined their businesses. You'd go and see other countries and see how coronavirus really did affect them. Um, I don't believe it has affected us. And as long as you're not the only one, you know, you know it's fine. I believe there's the economy and then there is your economy. And I just will not participate in doing good. If I was to say the words, your skill set, what are the things that come to your mind? I think I get on very well with people and put, people in place i don't manage people so i i'm quite good at needing people but i know that i can't manage people my ultimate skill set is knowing things i'm not good at and shouldn't be doing mm-hmm. um i'm good at growing a business but not operating it i've never cashed up locked up done a staff rotor got you done any of that even from when i was 15 i've never done anything like that people can't believe it. i'm honestly i've never Paid wages, paid bills. Then I employed a secretary at six digits. I just saw that as a low value task. Mm -hmm. And that's running a business, not operating it and, you know, not growing it. And so I just won't do those things. Quite an interesting mindset as well to have from such an early age because there is also another conflicting advice that that a lot of people give where it's like, learn everything about the company. I did do that. Yeah, because I was one person into a thousand people. So yeah, I'll answer the phones, I'll work on the tills, you know, I'll die in service, but yeah. I'm not going to do repeatable tasks. When it comes to starting and building your own brand versus acquiring brands and growing those businesses, you've done both. Mm-hmm. So talk to you about some of the similarities there and differences. There are pros and cons of both. If you can buy a business that you just know has got great foundations, it's making money, but the owner's had enough and doesn't want to run it anymore, but everyone knows it, then that is a brilliant opportunity. So when I think of, uh, you know, in my head, I've got Rossi ice cream. Why did I buy that? It's a century old, multi-generational. When I bought that, the press were calling me. They wanted interviews outside here. Then the Rossi parlor we've just bought back. We've had Channel 4, Grace and Perry come down and do a documentary about it about six weeks ago with me. Yeah, they're, they're those things. Only time get you you're gonna have a great product but when it's been multi-generational people just know it you know why well, people know the john lewis christmas ad you know that that stuff that years in the game mm-hmm. you know shoot that can be really powerful and then if you can add innovation back into that business then really great things can happen and um, when i look at doing tastic which is the business we're absolutely started from scratch the first three years are really hard you know because you're finding customers you've got to get credibility out there but you know we've had that six years now and that's an extremely profitable part of our business and we haven't got any legacy problems it's all us to answer your question i would always start to sole trade a business and learn commercial awareness okay 
and then start buying other companies. What are the best way to learn commercial awareness? And great entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs that I meet, I'm really good at sales and marketing. And I don't mean, um, you know, they're really good at Instagram and modern marketing. They actually get how to write good copy, good headlines, yeah. um, call to action stuff. And that, that stuff hasn't changed, by the way. You know, we, before we came on and done this, we were talking about YouTube and how powerful the headlines and the thumbnails are on yeah. YouTube. But actually, that is, that is marketing from 50, 60, 70 years ago. It's like a newspaper headline. Yeah. The, the stuff hasn't changed. And the people that actually got what made people buy a newspaper understand what makes people click on Instagram, that makes people click on YouTube. And so if you can get that stuff and get really good at convincing people to buy from you, and I you know, enough talking about getting customers and teaching marketing, but once you get that stuff, then you're always made money. Mm -hmm. Most business owners, they start out in a marketing focus and then they move into an operating focus to look after the customer they've got and then they dwindle and they never go to the next level. So I spend most of my time on market. When it comes to competitors and differentiating yourself in the market, how have you basically been able to have your own share of voice within the market? It's very easy because most people are not very good at marketing. Brick and water businesses in the spaces I operate, we've always been, you know, just doing some marketing literally makes you, you know, a maverick in the space. Mm -hmm. Most small businesses are not doing nowhere near enough marketing, so it's very easy to make some space. Mm -hmm. They're just not good at that. That's why we know so few companies. Yeah. You got two choices. You either like my Rossi ice cream thing is in the business and it's known because of a hundred years. Yeah. But what if you're only? How can you get known? in five years very quickly is by being very good at marketing. You started everything at a time when social media was non-existent, really. Yeah, yeah. So there were forms of marketing. Had just come in. 2007 was just like, you know, it was just coming. Facebook was just coming around and YouTube was there and I, I knew that we should be doing stuff in this space, but I used all the old-fashioned stuff still. Leaflets, Massive. I used to do turn on fifty thousand. If it's leaflets are still massively underutilized, less and less people are doing it. Direct mail letters in the post are just so powerful for SME businesses, especially if you know who your customers with a really powerful database. All this stuff is, you know, so underutilized and gets such good return on investment. And send a letter out fifty three pence with an envelope of stamp. You know, and that gets in to the right person. That's going to be way more powerful than a Facebook click. Well, you should be doing that too as well. If I really want to get in front of someone, they're yeah. a massive box, you know, teddy bears, ice cream, balloons, I've said, yeah. iPads. I want to get in front of someone. That is the best thing to do. You have ventured into the YouTube, Instagram space where you're giving advice to a lot of entrepreneurs. You've also written some books and you've started a podcast as well. Why have you gotten into this area number one it's my virtual scrapbook should anything happen to me i want my children to be able to see stuff you now when you look back in 10 years time that's gonna be really powerful it's even more but it's powerful now looking back five years where we've come secondly it's those staff that are able to see what we're doing that builds culture and if you've got great culture and everyone knows what's going on it's really powerful and thirdly is it helps business owners and i like speaking at seminars and doing my own seminars and this is the way I get my customers for that business. So with the work that you've been doing online and public speaking, it requires a lot of confidence to get up on stage and do that. And obviously you built that from when you started Jim Road Party Now. Was there any work that you did before that? Or were you always quite a confident individual? No, I've always, a lot of people have got a fear of being on stage. I've got a fear of not being on stage. Of being, and that's why I, you know, I knew that I'd can be a magician, kids entertainer forever. And so, you know, I pivoted. That was probably another reason why I made content subconsciously that it allowed me to do that. Have I got confidence? Yeah, I suppose I'm gifted with that. But I have no choice, you know. I don't, you know, I left time very young and, you know, all those battle scars, you know, gave me untold amounts of confidence. Mm -hmm. Um. And I've all had for a very young age always gone very well with adults and people older than me. And so I just sort of, you know, I used to get very nervous when I started doing kids' parts. I'd be 16 charging adults, you know, 150, 200 pounds 
be a and now, so that's equivalent of, say, £600 now. Yeah. Yeah, and do their kids' party. And, and I began that. Someone could book a kid's entertainer. I was meeting millionaires and very the wealthier part of society from a very young age. And I was building rapport and relationships with them and building a customer database. People were coming back to me year after year. And, you know, I was doing footballers and very successful business people. And I suppose, you know, I was just... You know, I was doing four or five gigs a day sometimes. So I was really building up you know, people management. Subconsciously, it's like muscle memory for me to walk into a room and make sure that I have that confidence. But I'm an introvert. Although I might come out extrovertly and be able to do that, I, you know, I'm best on my own. I like my own company. I don't like socialising. Yeah, we pick up. I just, you know, I don't like parties. I find it quite hard to um, talk about the weather. You know? Yeah, yeah. If it's a great conversation, boo, I'm in. Do you prefer then to be talking to someone more one-on-one rather than in a group? And I don't mean when you're on stage in front of an audience. I mean when you're when you're in social camera. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. So, yeah, so I, people, my other half would say, oh, he's about to interview you. Yeah, so I could be very direct and in to someone, but not at all. And I don't bike fluffiness you know if a meeting can be done in 10 minutes then 10 minutes it is but if it's a blue sky meeting like a vision meeting like what we're going to be doing in the future i'll happily do that all day you know because that i see as very good use of time i really want your perspective on this because one thing i ask every guest is about some of the things that they didn't know when they started so when you started off compared to now what has been something you really didn't know in the beginning which you learned and it's been quite vital for your journey well, in building successful businesses is having the end in mind, which I had, but writing it down is so much more powerful. Producing monthly management accounts are the bedrock of success in business, knowing what you're doing monthly and don't worry about annual accounts. You know, they're for tax management accounts are for running a business. Um, and if you're not producing monthly accounts, then you are never ever going to get to where you want to be they are just beautiful clicking average customer value i didn't do that soon enough um and understanding labor to turnover ratio that building a team is actually what builds a business um i got that but i didn't get it enough quick enough so most people have got profitable jobs and i've my heart bleeds for them because they'll get if they don't building into it is with for someone wants to buy they're actually better off working for someone mm-hmm. um because you, you end up work you know over stretching self working so hard by being a one man band or a one woman band that when you want to exit the business all you've got is a database at best mm-hmm. and that that is really really sad and i i should have gone faster and quicker i think I always say this, you should employ the good people before you can afford them. I always didn't pay myself, I paid others for years. So I would um, uh, you know, bookkeepers, accountants, and pay them and not earn anything out of the business myself. I've done that for like seven years, and that, that was just me pension planning, investing, and mine of what I have now because of those sacrifices. Yeah, and those early decisions. And the pressure of having a payroll makes you a better business person because you know you get to pay that person, so you make sure you're getting in customers and making sure you're profitable because you can be a little bit lazy if you haven't got positive pressure on you especially in you know the freelancer space you know but you know, that I'm making whatever thousands of pounds per month you know it's all lovely it's easy I've got no stuff but what if you get ill what if you get ill what if that happens to you mm-hmm. you can't go out and do that stuff mm-hmm. you know you should have been investing some of that into a team that can run the business without you um, and then then you have a great lot is there anything that you are working to improve on now that you feel like you need to learn more about? Are you willing to get a bit vulnerable and share with us what that might be? I need to get out but for residential property and invest all my money back into more commercial property. Where that is to mind you, I'm a trading business and he's very smart. So I like the idea of hotels um, because they're good for inheritance tax. So should I die and it passes on as a Going in sandwich is way more tax efficient than buy to property properties, but I don't really know how to 
run hotels. Um, I thought a good idea because I'm in hospitality and so I will be seeking advice for that uh, from people that I know in the space that can give me the good strategic advice to make them as profitable as possible. You probably get asked this quite a lot, but how do you balance everything? And I'm I'm actually going to first ask you with relation to your your many businesses. Let's just talk about that first, and then we'll talk about your personal life. Well, the businesses once they get bigger, it gets easier. You know, we're a business that will do thirty million in revenue. You know that it allows you to afford great people, and they do all of the day to day. I don't run anything day to day. I'm not to be here and do this with you, and it's all running. Okay. They just need me to grow it. The secret to building a great business, and this is my formula for success, is E plus M equals S. That's entrepreneurship plus management equals success. And what people are forgetting is this management part. Is entrepreneurs try to be managers and entrepreneurs combined. Very rarely works. The best way of describing it is you're running a school. You're the head teacher and the teacher's doing all the work. And the teachers need the head teacher. But if you remove any one of those two elements, then there's no success for the student. So the head teacher said, this is what I want to achieve. This is where I want us to take the school. I want us to be outstanding. I want us to you know, deliver great things for the kids and the teachers. And this thing, and yes, we understand, we will deliver on that work. Now, if you remove all the teachers and the head teacher said, well, I'm going to be the teacher now, plus I'm going to do all this vision planning for the future stuff, they'll end up being overwhelmed and overworked and you know, fall, fall apart. But that's most people are trying to do both, and they will fall out that. They're doing it because they feel they can't cash flow both. So I will always go, well, how much is that person? That's £40,000. I think from £40,000 to pay that person. Or go divided by 12 and times it by three. And you afford three months' salary. Have you got savings to do that? Um, and then once you've got that full-time team member, if they're good, you recruit to well after 90 days they start being profitable you move from being a solopreneur at that stage into entrepreneur you're building a management team yeah the most valuable part of the business is the management team not the property not the the stock it is the management team you get a great management team just typical profits you look at a day nursery you know the the manager can make a nursery make a hundred thousand pounds a year or four hundred thousand pounds a year same building same staff the strength of the manager. In leadership and entrepreneurship is one part. Management is the other part. You why, why is McDonald's such a great business? Is micromanaged. You know, whether you like eating McDonald's or not, it wouldn't want being a pound behind them as a company, would you? And it is a micromanaged, franchisable business. You know, what you people should be thinking is, how can I make my business more franchise? Well, not to set it as a franchise, but that discipline would help you build a better business. I think that differentiation is really key as well because it's so easy to get stuck in the weeds or even hiring the right managers take that kind of risk as well. What is the risk? So here's the thing as well. I, I always find lots of entrepreneurs and people in business, they've got some money and they're prepared to go and buy a buy-to-let property. I did the same. I put £50,000 into the buy-to-let property and I'm going to make £200 a month profit from it. Why? Put £50,000 into a salary, make a quarter of a million pound a year profit. You find the right person that you add them into business, and then I rest my case. Are you quite intuitive when it comes to no, that? No, I've made no's of client mistakes. You have to kiss a few frogs to find your prince. Okay. Loads. But we've made some really good ones, but we keep going. We don't, just because one's gone wrong, or two's gone wrong, or three's gone wrong, why serve my managers? And what cash do you need? What? Where do we want to take stuff? I'm working on this. You know, they, 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 they're not doing the vision stuff. You know, they're the master might have gone and bought that. How's he doing all that? Everyone says it to me all the time. Mm-hmm. How are you doing it? Well, it's because I spend loads of money on management because I believe in E plus M equals S. And the other part of my, that question was about personal life as well yeah. and balancing that. I, historically, I was terrible. Would I work seven days a week? Yes, I absolutely would. Would I work seven evenings a week? Yes, I absolutely would. I have two children. I love my children. I toss the on stage. Um, you know, I want to be with them, but I have a work of it. Yeah, no two ways about it. I love what I do. Do I have the best work-life balance? Probably not, no. But am I better than I thought I would have been? Yeah, I like most weekends. Yeah, I don't work every weekend anymore. Mm-hmm. I do tape. I took my children to school this morning. You know, I love spending time with them. 
going on holidays, which I never used to do. But I would, if I didn't have that structure of family around me, would work all the time. And where do you see this all going in the next 10 years? Just keep going. Don't really want to sell anything. You know, if I didn't sell anything, I'd put the work and the money into doing something even bigger. Listening to you, I get very Disney and Cadbury vibes. I want to, I want legacy businesses that, that by the time I'm finished, they're amazing. You know, it's very difficult when you're building, you know, the sort of businesses I do that need lots of cash, you know, it takes generations to make them amazing. You're constantly putting millions of pounds into improving, improving, improving. I don't want partners and venture capitalists. I can't do that. You know, I mean, yes, I could, I could go up to London tomorrow and get, I can massively accelerate what I'm doing. And, and you've Love. never ventured down to VC? Yeah, I've spoken. They, they, they message me and talk to me all the time. Every week, one of them comes to me. Someone literally last week, we'll give you 10 million quid to grow it. I'm, nah, just, I like to chat with them because I like listening to what they've got to say. A stump for me. Yeah, you know, do I borrow millions of pounds? Yeah, absolutely. Borrowed millions and millions and millions. Pay back millions and borrowed more millions. Pay back millions and borrowed more millions. And yeah, I would borrow untold amounts of money um, if I thought it was the commercially right thing to do. For anybody listening and watching, can you tell them where they can find you on socials? Yeah, just go to my YouTube channel, Jen Sinclair. There's like 600 plus videos there to help grow your business. Um, they're really cool in terms of style and um, we made them quite entertaining to watch. Um, you know, I've got a podcast as well called Jim Sinclair's Business Broadcast, but yeah, YouTube really start there and then it'll feed you off to the other stuff. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming down and sharing your whole journey with us. Thank you very much.